I have been bullied to my absolute breaking points. A group of guys keeps calling me names and then did the unspeakable act to me. The one that starts with R. I was unjustly accused of a crime that I didn't commit and was punished for it. I was forced into labor all night long outside while it was less than 10 degrees. When they found me out in the field the next day when the sun had risen, I snapped and unleashed my revenge on everyone. Here's what happened. Subscribe to Am I the Jerk on YouTube. YouTube and hit the bell to turn on notifications. This is my story. I finally feel like I can talk about this particular time in my life and appreciate what it took. Here's the background. This pro revenge took place when I was in high school in the mid 2000s, a time in my country when there was much public outcry over bullying and hazing in boarding schools. A couple of students in different schools had died from injuries resulting from bullying. Other schools were rioting and burning things. They were under increased scrutiny. It was a whole thing. Personally, my life in school was not fun. I was a fat boy with very low self-esteem going into my first year. The bullying I received led to a depression. I was prone to recklessness and a bit of undoing myself ideation. The thing that made high school particularly nightmarish was the extreme bullying due to my orientation. Low-key comments about my orientation from this group of about five boys led to situations where they called me and my best friends gay. The social stigma associated with being gay here is really extreme. These boys would stalk and terrorize me. They left threatening notes under my sheets that would say, we're going to mess you up for being a gay. And even a note that says, we're going to do the unspeakable act to you that starts with R. So I had only one close friend who knew what was going on. And ironically, after an entire term of convincing everyone that I was gay, this same group of people began doing things to me that they were bullying me for in the first place. I'll spare you the details, but my first year in high school was the worst time of my life. But you're not here for my sad story, so moving on. Sometime in the middle of the term, the vice principal of our school was changed due to the aforementioned public backlash from the bullying scandals. The previous vice principal was a decent man, but the new vice principal was not. He came with a well-earned reputation of being unnecessarily harsh, dishing out suspensions and expulsions like candy on Halloween. That brings us to the last straw. A few weeks after the new vice principal came in, and I'm having an incredibly terrible week that is really battering my mind. Yes, all the bullying and all those things that that group of guys were doing to me was still going on. But every Friday night, a group of kids used to climb through a window into the computer lab and play video games. The windows had bars on them, but a slim person could fit through. I am not slim by any definition, unless the definition of slim is fat. Among this group of kids was the troublemaker dude in my class and my dorm with the same common name. It turns out the vice principal had confused the two of us, and I was the one who was in his crosshairs. That Friday, the kids were caught. Some of them, including my namesake, managed to escape. The vice principal was called in and the students who were caught snitched. Security was sent to the dorms to bring the other culprits. Cue me being woken up at 3 a.m. and dragged to the scene of the crime to endure a punishment for something that I hadn't done. Corporal punishment was tactically legal then and now. My explanation that there clearly is no way for me to fit through the window were met with more canings. What really pissed me off was that the vice principal had us bring our belongings to his office at night for an inspection with the excuse of searching for stolen computer equipment. He came across my very private journal and like the jerk he was, proceeded to ridicule me for having a diary in front of the other teachers, watchmen, and the students that I was bundled in with. It didn't help matters that I broke down and cried in front of them. I don't think I ever felt so much humiliation in my life before. The following morning, we were suspended for two weeks. Two weeks later, my parents took me back to school. I had only told them of the mistaken identity that I suspected and the wrongful accusation. They already knew about the bullying. I didn't tell them about the vice principal going through my diary or the things that that group of guys was doing to me. I was still writhing in humiliation. The vice principal, being the absolute jerk that he was, had convinced himself that I was the ringleader of this group of boys. Again, mistaken identity and thus deserved extra punishment. He ordered me to clear out large patches of weeds outside and overgrown grass between the rugby patch and the hockey field about the size of a football field only using a slasher. Just as I'm about to head out, it starts raining and it's the middle of July. So there are much colder temperatures, regularly dipping to below 10 degrees Celsius at night. So instead of going to the field, I head to class to wait out the rain. A few minutes later, the vice principal barged in furious, interrupting the geography lesson. He proceeded to tear me a new one, even mentioning my private journal and he threatened to expel me 
if I left the field before I finished my punishment. Mind you, this was one of the best schools in our region. It had actually been my first choice. He then proceeded to cane me again just to make his point stick. At this point, I just broke. All of his punishment was due to something that I had not done. I was completely innocent, but this jerk just couldn't listen. The ridicule, the humiliation, the bullying, everything all just came to a head at that point, and I decided to just say to hell with all of it. So I walked out into the rain, slasher in hand, with not even a sweater. This was about four in the afternoon. I never returned. I think the vice principal never really expected me to complete the punishment, but then I doubt he had ever met someone who decided they had no more cares left to give either. My initial plan was to crucify him with his own words. Dusk fell with me, cold and drenched, ripping up ferns from the ground. By midnight, I was shivering and crying uncontrollably, and it was too dark to see anything. I still persevered and started blindly cutting the grass, driven by this mad desire to just hurt. I really didn't care who I hurt. Sure, a part of my motivation was that if I did get sick out there, the vice principal would be in a ton of trouble. But there was another part of me that was just like, why not? Life sucks anyway. By midnight, I was too cold to continue. I ran out of energy and just sat down under a tree. Towards dawn, I was so cold from the rain and the wind that my shivers began reducing. It was impossible for me to sleep. The teachers finally found me there a couple of hours after dawn. Apparently, the teacher on duty had found my desk empty during the morning study time between 4.30 and 6 a.m. When he asked where I was, it came out that I had not been in bed since the previous night either. He then called the vice principals and the other teachers who began searching the school and they finally found me in the field. This is where the pro-revenge begins. I don't know much about what happened immediately after. I was so out of it. I do remember the teachers rushed me to the school nurse who immediately recommended I be taken to the hospital. I spent a week there due to complications. I got pneumonia and a very expensive week it was, all on the school's dime. My parents were pissed and I couldn't blame them. The school's board of governors convened after my parents contacted them. The days before my parents and I were called in to speak before the board, I had the idea to just face my fears and put everything out into the open. I was just done with that school and everybody there. So on that day, in front of a group of musty old men in the boardroom, I finally shed my burden. I told them everything. My only motivation being to bury the piece of trash VP, the vice principal, and my tormentors. I don't think I've ever done anything that scary before. From the mistaken identity, the suspension, the punishment in the rain, the threat to expel me if I decided to seek shelter, and the crown jewel, the bullying, and everything that group of guys had done to me in private, I laid it all out. I knew that would definitely get their attention. The board called my best friend, who backed me up. The vice principal was in no position to win a he said, they said contest with us at that moment. The vice principal was fired that day. A few days later, a zero tolerance policy on bullying was announced. I think the board was actually afraid of finding themselves in the news for all the wrong reasons. They didn't want their school to be one of those schools, despite the fact that it was one of the worst. Over the holidays, my friend told me that things got really serious after that. People didn't know why, but suddenly, any act of bullying was met with an immediate and unconditional expulsion. As for the boys who had been terrorizing me, they were arrested. My dad went to the police with those threatening notes that I had been receiving all year long. The school board supported us in this on the condition that we, my parents and I, do not take the story to the media. I was happy with that arrangement. I had no desire to be the face of male R-word victims. We had a few meetings with an investigator from the public prosecutor's office. A couple of months later, the office reached out, told us the boys had pled guilty. One of them got off scot-free because his dad was a senior army guy. Sounds like corruption, shake my head. But three of them got 10 years each. The last one got 18. The topping, they were all in their fourth and final year. They got arrested just as they were about to sit for their national exams to go to university. Their lives are ruined and I have absolutely no remorse for them. So, am I the jerk? This story was so intense that it's hard to imagine how somebody could have survived all of this. And I think at the end of the day, the original poster here's saving grace was that all of this happened to take place during the time when there were all these bullying scandals. So the school and everyone involved had no choice but to take this seriously or else they would face what they would consider pretty serious repercussions. I'm assuming losing funding would be the first of their many problems. And you could tell that that was clearly the case because when they made the deal with the original poster here, they told him they would take care of everything, but only under the condition that he would not go to the media. So in the end, they were still looking out for themselves above anyone else, even more so than looking out for him. It's pretty sick to see that 
one of the guys that did all this to the original poster here got away with it. And that's all because of who his dad was. Whereas everyone else in the group ended up getting locked away for years on end, over 10 years for all of them, besides the one that got away with it scot-free. Doing something like that to someone deserves the harshest punishment, not just walking away from it like nothing happened because of who your dad is. So I don't see any way that any part of his revenge was unjustified, especially because it led to them getting locked up. It led to the vice principal losing his job. But let me know how you see this. Do you think his revenge was justified as well? Or do you think it was going too far somehow? And jerk or not a jerk and why? Before we jump into the next one, if you like Am I the Jerk, you're probably going to love Am I the Genius. Check it out, link down below in the description. I know a woman who may be the dumbest person alive. Don't believe me? Listen to this. So I've had a friend since college who's a great guy. I love him to pieces, but I've occasionally considered ending the friendship because his wife is so jarringly dumb. For the life of me, I do not know what he gets from her. Okay, I do. She's one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in real life, but even still, I don't know how he does it. She's sweet, she means well, but there are sandwiches more intellectually stimulating. A while back, I had a friend visiting Camden, and she was dropping her kids by to hang out with mine. I invited her to stay for a bite to eat because yes, she's exquisitely dumb, but she's perfectly friendly. Camden's been trying to break into acting and he recently had a big part on a TV medical drama. So I brought it up saying, Camden just recently had a small role as a doctor on this show. She went, oh, that's so exciting. Congratulations. That must not be easy to get a job there. So what kind of doctor are you? And he explained, oh, it was a very minor role. I didn't get a specialty or anything. I didn't even get a name. And she laughed and went, well, we all feel that way when we first start, regardless of what job. Just keep working hard and you'll get all that stuff over time. But don't sell yourself short. It's not easy to be a doctor. And he took the compliment and went into how he went about playing the role. The body language he tried to adopt for the intensive care unit. That sort of stuff. Then she cut him off and went, actually you know what if you wouldn't mind my son actually has this oblong cyst developing on the small of his back for a couple of weeks now. I'd really appreciate it if you could take a look. So we both laughed thinking that she was joking and I was impressed with her uncharacteristic high level joke but then she actually started to call her son over it's just like her to start a funny joke and then take it way too far Camden confused and weirded out by the whole thing started saying oh no uh hey uh they didn't teach us any medical stuff for the part I can't like help you with this I jumped in and changed the subject but she left shortly after I'd long since given up on trying to explain to her why some jokes are funny and other jokes are not so I thought I'd let it be even though she seemed kind of miffed when she left. Later, she came back to pick up her kids, and by then, Camden had gone home. As she was leaving, she remarked, You know, it was very rude of your friend to not at least look in my son's sis. It would have taken him like 10 seconds. I hate how doctors think they're above helping anyone unless they're getting a check. Didn't they take an oath to always help out anyone who needs medical advice or something? So as I processed the pure bitterness in her voice, I realized that she genuinely and truly truly thought Camden was a medical doctor. So convinced I must be misunderstanding her, I further reiterated, no, he's an actor. He played a doctor on that show. You've seen the show. And for the record, it's not a small production. It's like Grey's Anatomy or House. Everyone knows it. And even angrier now, she said, of course I have. I know all about it. It's one of the best hospitals in the country. Why do you think they put it on TV? Being in the spotlight like that, you think he'd try and be a little more professional with people. That's all I'm saying. The surreal mix of entitlement and delusion in her statement left me dumbstruck and I decided I must be misinterpreting this somehow because there was no way any grown adult who votes, drives, works, and has kids of her own is that stupid. Not even her. So I just let her leave rather than risk offending her or embarrassing myself. As soon as she was gone, I called my friend, her husband, to try and catch him before he was home. I relayed the whole series of events to him and his response oh that yeah it's a problem but not entirely her fault oftentimes those shows use stories ripped from the headlines of the actual news you know so you can see why she gets mixed up sometimes she bumped into camden at my anniversary party not too long after and asked him with genuine concern if a character on the show who'd been in an accident again on the show was recovering well he tried telling her in plainer terms i don't 
work there. I'm not a doctor. I just played one that one time. <laughs> and she said she was so sorry to hear that he'd been let go. And where was he working now? So if you wonder how our country ended up where we are, know that she has a bachelor's degree from an accredited college with several subordinates and partial responsibility over our city's water supply. So advocate for education reform whenever you can and enjoy these twilight years of the great American experiment. I can't believe this is actually a real person, but it seems too specific not to be. There's even more the OP adds on about her saying other top highlights of hers include remarking on how it's a sign that God loves America best above all others because fireworks always happen on the 4th of July. She thought fireworks were a natural phenomenon like the northern lights or volcanoes, stubbornly insisting on eating an actual rose, not icing a real rose off a cake because if it's on the cake, it must be edible. And lastly, calling poison control after taking baby aspirin because it's for babies, not for adults. I hope in the future this OP writes more stories about this lady because in some weird way, it's kind of fascinating to see her perspective on the world that we all live in. The OP thinks she's really dumb, but maybe she's actually enlightened. So let me know if you guys have ever met anyone like this in your life, and if so, what happened? And don't forget, you can submit your stories via the link down below in the description. I called roadside assistance today, and this is what happened. I blew out a tire while driving this afternoon, pulled off the busy road to a side street to assess the damage and start working on replacing the flat with the spare tire from the trunk. It turned out that the lug wrench provided in this particular car was absolutely tiny and thus provided very little leverage. Try as I might, I only managed to loosen one of the five lug nuts holding the tire on. No problem, I thought, as I have roadside assistance coverage on my auto insurance. A short call later and my insurance has dispatched a local service provider and I receive a text that Daryl from the local provider will be arriving at my location by 2.34 p.m. That's less than a half an hour wait, so I'm pretty happy. At 2.33 p.m., a van approaches and the driver waves at me and pulls over. The driver immediately hops out with a toolkit in hand and we exchange brief pleasantries and I explain my problem. The driver smiles and tells me the same thing happened to him just last month and says not to worry about it. He takes out a proper wrench, I hand him the jack slash spare, and he has my car back in operation in about six minutes flat. It was at this point that the conversation got a bit muddled. I asked him if he needed anything from me, like a signature to ensure that he gets paid, and he responds that no money is necessary. I try to clarify my question and explain that I have roadside assistance on my policy and that my insurer got him dispatched to me and that I think they will pay his employer for the service call. His response? Oh, no one dispatched me. I was just driving by and thought you could use some help. So you're not Daryl? No, Brian. I can't believe that I handed this guy my jack and just watched him crank up my car while lying frozen on the pavement. I don't even remember how many times I apologized. The guy wouldn't even let me hand him some cash. He just left in full cheer and told me to pay it forward. In the aftermath, I waited another 10 minutes for Daryl but gave up and left after finding his employer's phone number and canceling the help request. My insurer had been sending me automated texts all day along the lines of, has your service provider arrived yet? Reply Y if yes and if no. Has your service been completed yet? And how likely are you to recommend the service provider from 1 to 10? I can't figure out how to respond in such a way that nobody gets in trouble or over slash underpaid. Anyway, thanks Brian. The fact that there's actually Brian's out there in the world helping people out when they're in situations like this is pretty great to see. We always see stories of people trying to scam each other or try to hurt each other, but every once in a while you just get a good guy like Brian to show up. I've seen a couple of these videos where guys will go out and do this and then try and record it. And the people always seem flabbergasted when they won't accept any cash. Like they think that it must be a scam if they're not taking cash in that moment. So let me know if you've ever been in a situation like this yourself, or maybe you are the Brian. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories linked at the top of the description. And if you like Am I the Jerk, give Am I the Genius a shot, also linked in the description. Either way, thanks a lot for listening. We'll see you guys next time.